Hello, everyone. We have about five more minutes until we're going to get started. I see some people logging on, and Mike tells me there's about 10, 15 people watching on our uh, live stream to YouTube. So hello to everyone live on YouTube. We're very excited to have you here today. Um, we're just going to get some stuff set up in the background, and then we'll, we'll start the event. Um, thanks again for joining, and we'll talk to you soon. So stop. Switch, click if you want us to switch microphone or speaker. No, no, microphone. <laughs> Is this Sasha? I can hear you, Sasha. Oh, whoops. <laughs> no worries. You sound great. I can't see you, but I can hear you. <laughs>
I want to welcome everyone again to our event today um, on art and advocacy when addressing global refugee crisis in particular. We're so excited to welcome our speaker, Max Frieder, from uh, the global NGO Artolution. It's amazing. You're going to have such a wonderful conversation here today. We're incredibly excited to get started. We're just going to wait our speakers joining us from um, an offsite location. It's just logging in now. And so we're going to let a lot of people just coming online. And as they do, we'd love to test your microphone. Oh, I can hear someone in the background. Oh, Max, it's good to see you. Hello. Hello, everybody around the world. How's everyone doing? I can see so many people here. Mm -hmm. So, Max, it's so wonderful to see you again. It's so good to see you again as well. I thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so thrilled to be able to have such an such a an exciting conversation on such an important topic um, now more than ever. So it's really an honor, and thank you so much for the invitation. Oh well, wow. we're so great. I follow you on Twitter, and yeah. uh, and uh, man, like this, and and on Instagram, and the pictures you post on Instagram are amazing. Every time I'm just like, I've met that guy. Oh. <laughs> but it's one of those things, I think, in the current time, that if you're looking for a method or, or images of inspiration and hope and, and you know, like all those wonderful things that your channel on Instagram is such a wonderful one to follow because it just, just like warms the heart every time one of your posts come up. So I hope we'll push it today. Maybe at the end we'll be, do a big push, like follow on Instagram. You got to do it to feel joy in the world. It's times like these, right? That we want to come that. together and yeah. celebrate those moments. Beautiful. Totally, totally. I couldn't so agree more. Have, Thank you for saying that. With the COVID um, the stuff going on, many of our Canadian schools are not allowed to share Zoom links. Such is, such is the thing. So we have kids, because our schools in Canada are completely closed down, we have teachers that have shared the links onto their Google Classrooms and are joining us from YouTube. So I've just heard in the back end that we have already have 25 people logged on through YouTube. So I think we'll get a few more as a, as we get past 10 o'clock because early risers in those high school years, hey. But uh, we do have a lot of people who are logged on here as well. And I just want everyone to know that if you do have a question for Max, you can tweet us, you can reply on the live stream feed. We have Mike in the background who's be checking those and uh, he'll be relaying the information to us, asking the questions. And then everyone who's here logged on online, you're welcome. We'll have opportunities for you to ask questions of Max directly. and. He's here to share his wonderful ideas and organization and messages of hope um, with you. And I'm, I'm just so excited to have you back again, sir. Um, so we are about to, I'm just gonna pause for one second as I, I, as we are all juggling childcare and work, we're gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna pause for one second and be right back. <laughs> All right, everyone, I want to say a big welcome to our event today. Um, I'm, my name is Sarah. I'm with the Center for Global Education. Oh, and we have someone here in the background. I am just going to do a little muting. <laughs> Wonderful. So everyone, it's going to be so important. We have a lot of people coming in and out today of, the, of our uh, session. So if you log in and you notice that your mic un, un, um, mutes itself, I want you to take the initiative to mute yourself back on. Because with so many people in the background, if we have all of our microphones unmuted at the same time, it's going to be hard for us to focus on the presentation. So I'll keep an eye on things as well. We hear in the background, we'll, we'll make sure that we're, we're trying to keep everyone on top of things. But if you notice that you've become unmuted and it's not your turn to ask a question, why don't you just go bloop, and hit that button again? Sound good? Oh, I just saw someone do it. So great. We're all on top of this together. All right, we're going to start again. Welcome to today's talk on global refugee crisis, art, and advocacy. My name is Sarah. I'm with the Center for Global Education here in Alberta, Canada. Ben, today, 
is being uh, sponsored and, and a partnership is being offered in partnership with the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. And CC UNESCO helps Canadians share knowledge locally and globally in order to create better societies. Um, we build to build peace in minds of men and women across our nation and around the world. Uh, to do so, the commission facilitates cooperation in the fields of education, science, culture, communication, and information to address some of the most complex challenges facing the world today. We want to thank CC UNESCO for joining with us on this great event, and I think it really exemplifies their work in education and their work um, to sort of empower students around the world to, to engage in knowledge and sharing and advocacy and action. We, it's not just about learning, it's about what do we do with that knowledge? How do we represent it in our schools and our communities? And what steps can we take to make the world a better place? So thank you, CC UNESCO, for coming alongside us today. Now, I'll start off today with a land acknowledgement. Um, in Canada, we're going through a process of reconciliation, and that a part of that involves acknowledging the land that we, we are on and that we share with the, those around us. And historically, um, it didn't belong to the settlers and the colonizers who came to this country, and, and through the process of reconciliation, we're coming to terms with that and understanding it and trying to re recognize what that means to our lives today. So I'm joining you from Treaty 6 land, and I'd like to, to acknowledge that it's the traditional meeting place and territory of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. And I want to acknowledge all the many First Nations and Métis and Inuit peoples whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. So with that acknowledgement and that welcome, I'd also like to acknowledge our guest speaker today, Max Frieder, who's joining us from, um, well, actually, I don't know where in the world he's joining us from today. He... Uh, Last time it was um, Paris, I think. And so, Max, I might throw over to you to tell us where you are in the world today. So, I am in New York City, um, which is the headquarters of our work. And I um, actually just returned from Brazil, where I was working in the different favela communities doing programs over the last uh, three weeks during Carnival. So, I'm thrilled to be here and to be able to talk to so many inspired people all over the world. So thank you again for the invitation. Wonderful. Now, Max, maybe I know you always have these amazing pictures and, and everything, but before we dive into that, can you tell us a little bit about the organization that you, I, I think you're the, the director of, but again, I'm, uh, I'll let you sort of situate yourself. Sure. Um, so... Just to give everybody a background as to who I am and why we're having this, this conversation across continents in the world. Um, so my name is Max Frieder. I am the co-founder and co-executive director of an international community-based public art education organization called Art Olution, like an evolution or a solution or a resolution or revolution, Art Olution. And we are an international institution, we're an international organization, and our primary focus is to teach local artists and educators in refugee camps, conflict zones, and traumatized communities around the world how to be able to facilitate their own programs for their communities on a sustainable and ongoing basis. And we've been doing this work for uh, really over a decade and a half, just about started in 2009. And we've worked in 30 countries around the world and currently have ongoing programs in eight regions globally. And since this is such a global focus, especially with UNESCO, I'm going to tell you what the eight different regions are. And just as a quick kind of small message is that we work with UNESCO. Um, we work very closely with UNESCO with their education and emergencies um, uh, sector, and we've been doing programs with them globally. So this is very exciting as a new way to engage UNESCO, including the Canadian Commission, who I met with at their international conference in Paris, which is when the last time I spoke. So the eight regions that we work around the world are in the largest refugee camp in the world and in the largest refugee camp in history, which is the Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh. We work extensively in the Bidi Bidi refugee settlement in Uganda on the border of South Sudan. Oh, and the first is on the border of Myanmar with the Rohingya people who have fled the genocide that has been in Myanmar and now are in a refugee camp that has a accumulation of about 1.2 million people called Kutupolong and Balukali. 
The third location we work is in the Syrian refugee camps on the border of Syria, working in Jordan, and we extensively also work in Lebanon and Turkey in the past. We work in uh, Israel and Palestine, um, doing uh, programs with people of both sides together. We do programs uh, in Colombia on the border of Venezuela with the Venezuelan crisis, working with local Colombian artists. We work in uh, Greece on the border of uh, Turkey in the Greek refugee camps in Lesbos and Samos. Um, we work in Brazil in the favelas, uh, specifically in Rio de Janeiro. And then we work in the United States with asylum-seeking youth, uh, mostly who come from Latin America. Um, so we've been doing these programs for, uh, for a long time, but our real primary focus, our belief is the idea that if local artists and educators have the tools and have the curriculum and have the needed know-how, they have unbelievable talent to be able to bring out the stories of their own communities. And through doing this, our primary focus is community-based public art. So we do not really work only in classrooms or just teaching um, kind of about on pa a drawing on paper, but rather we teach about drawing on paper to use that to then do large scale murals. We build interactive sculptures out of trash and recycled objects that are musical called the Found Instrument Sound Instrument Project. We do programs that are based on performance, puppetry, dance, music. Um, all of which based on having communities tell their own stories uh, to a global audience. And the ideal is that in this time where there's people in so many different parts of the world who might seem so separate from each other, that the arts can build a bridge, that the arts can be a connector um, beyond any language, beyond any single culture, or any single issue, that the arts can bridge all people. And that that's a concept that, that we really believe has the capacity to heal and has the capacity to transform. Um, the last thing I'll say before I, I, I think Sarah will probably have some questions for me is that your timing for this amazing conference could not be better. Yesterday, literally yesterday, I finished my dissertation for my doctorate. Um, I've been working for four years on research, um, and I just uh, turned it in. I'm at a Teachers College at Columbia University um, with a, in the Art and Art Education Department with a specialization on community-based public art education in emergencies. And uh, I just wrote about a 441-page document, which is now um, being reviewed by my committee. So the timing is very good. And, 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 and because of that, you know, one of the biggest learnings that I've had is that in order to prepare people for the crises and traumas that are befalling the world, they need the tools to know how to build and rebuild resilience. And that's something that comes through the ability to connect and to feel that you can work with others, can cooperate, can collaborate with the sole guiding intention of being able to reshape the narrative of a community. And by reshaping those narratives through the process of saying, we have a problem. The problem, let's say, is clean water or gender-based violence or issues around displacement, ethnic tensions, refugee and host community relations, public health, issues about disease. You know, we can go on about many of the issues in many communities globally. Uh, the, the, the goal is that if you get a group of people together in one room and you say, OK, we have an issue, whatever that issue is, or even more so, you ask, what is the issue? And they say, well, we have big issues with child labor, let's say. The key is that if you get all those people together to be able to have a dialogue, a conversation about how they can craft a story to be able to then share that message with the world and with their own community, they become agents of social change, right? And they become those who can transform both their own lives, but kids and youth, especially high school students like you and teachers, can teach their own families can become teachers, can become advocates, and can become those who can promote really a better world and a better set of solutions and durable resolutions to issues that, um, that befall the world. And I truly believe that it's, it's both about dealing with issues that we're dealing with today, dealing about with issues that have caused some of the trauma in the past, and maybe even the most important is to, to, is to craft answers and stories and narratives around how to prepare for problems that will come in the future.
Um, we right now see that there are problems all over the world, and many people, unfortunately, we all can see that that problems are growing. So we need solutions that grow too. And that kind of evolution and really evolving iterative process is something that I believe is the next phase in the history of the arts. And it's the next phase in the history of education, which is a belief that people, no matter the countries, whether it be in Uganda or Bangladesh, in Canada or in Jordan, that, that, that kids teenagers and artists and educators can come together to be the leaders that can shape the future of those communities. And we, and we've done uh, over 500 programs around the world. Uh, every day we have teams who are being paid to do this work where our teams of, we have a team of 20 Rohingya refugee artists who are both Rohingya and Bengali who are being paid full time to do this um, as their job, right? Where they're putting food on their table by painting murals with kids, by being public art educators, teachers, and artists. Um, We're doing the same thing in in Jordan and in Uganda and in Colombia. And the dream is that this can really build a model, that this is a model for how people, both on the communal sense and on the individual sense, are able to find solutions to the problems both in their local community, but also how to be able to communicate across borders, right? And that's something that I think right now, that intercultural, intersectoral dialogue. Now, what does it mean when I say intersectoral? And that might be a good, a good thing. It looks like Sarah is about to ask a question. Um, I was just wondering if I could share some of the pictures that you have as well. While please, you're please, maybe while I'm speaking, just start yeah, is that okay? pictures. That would be okay. great. You, you don't need to see my face. The, the pictures are more <laughs> important than me. Um, so when I say intercept, yeah, yeah, and you can just start flipping through. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, I don't need to tell the story of each of them. Maybe I'll speak more generally. Um, so as um, when I say intersectoral, what I'm really talking about is this idea that different sectors can all accomplish the same goals through the process of the arts. So that whether that be public health and issues surrounding mental health, psychosocial development, wash sanitation and hygiene. Um, oh, and I want to take a pause. These projects, I also want you to know, are a combination of me and my partner. I'm the co-founder. I have one partner that I, I co-founded our organization with. Um, and his name is Joel Bergner. And um, we work together to be able to, to, to run this organization. I think it's important to, you know, pay, pay respect to where, where uh, it all came from. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think you should keep going. There's a lot in the slideshow. That, this is the same slideshow I, t- I sent you last time, right? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can go through the whole thing. Um, and, so, and so what do I mean when I say intersectoral? It's kind of a new terminology. And what it means is that, unfortunately, I believe, unfortunately, in many parts of the world, sectors are separated. So education and public health are kept separate right? The idea of wash sanitation, hygiene, and the child protection sectors are kept separate. What what we are striving to achieve is that through public art, through education, we're able to actually build bridges between different disciplines and sectors. So the idea that public health, let's say about the issues of washing hands or the issues of being able to take care of loved ones or nutrition, that those are intrinsically connected to education. Issues about literacy, how to be able to understand um, uh, curricula, how to be able to teach and to learn. Okay? Yet at the same time, sometimes that, that is something that's kept very separate. So we believe that the arts can actually be that bridge, can build that connection between all of these different disciplines that many times are very separate. We're also striving and we every day are actually collecting data. So what does it mean collecting data on such a unique medium as the arts and public art? We collect data by by doing interviews, focus groups, questionnaires, surveys, and asking different kids, you can see in a performance like here, what does this mean to you? What is, what is the significance of this in your lives? What have you learned? How has this affected your hopes and your dreams for the local artists like here? Uh, we, we are always asking, how can we help to support your professional development? How can we help to support your learning? And what do you need to provide the most effective learning environment for your kids and your context? 
I think in this day and age, contextually relevant art, contextually relevant programming and education is crucial to being able to create long-term and durable solutions. So when these pieces are being created, every one of them is in a direct reaction and relationship to the different issues in each community. So a good example of this is a, is a story, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this. Uh, I'm going to move into telling a couple of individual stories, which I think really demonstrate some of the crucial messages behind our work. So one of the stories was a program that we were doing in. So for example, this was uh, in, uh, in in India, working with children who'd been child trafficked and women who'd been sex trafficked specifically discussing issues about the importance of equity, safe learning spaces, and the ability to grow. And so all of these projects have a direct uh, questions uh, and answers, both questions to the audience who's viewing it and answers through the imagery that is being presented um, throughout every individual piece. Now, the contextual relevance, I think I'm going to use a story that I think is really important to, to, to cover. Um, I was working in Mexico City, where we've done programming, and we were doing a program on rainwater harvesting systems and water filtration, teaching about clean water, which is so important in Mexico, where there's so many severe issues. Um, this is my partner, his, his baby, so that's why I said that, <laughs> which is kind of funny, um, who, who we had and we traveled with for four months in Lebanon, Turkey, Jordan, Israel, and Palestine, so uh, traveling baby, uh, Amara. So... What, and this is in the Syrian refugee camps that you're looking at. So the story I wanted to share was actually in Mexico City. We're teaching about uh, clean water. We're doing this big mural. We're, we're doing this really exciting program. And what ends up happening is, th is that at the end of the program, three women that day come up to me, three mothers, and they say, with all due respect, we respect that you're teaching about, about water, but that's not the most important issue in our community. The most important issue in our community is domestic violence because of alcoholism. That's what we're dealing with every single day, as one of the women says with a black eye. She says, can you change this workshop to be about, about, about uh, prevention of domestic violence and about stopping alcoholism? And so, of course, we went home and we said, of course, we changed the whole curriculum overnight and we made it about nutrition. We made it about clean, about um, uh, healthy relationships. We made it about being able to understand what a healthy life means. And so we changed it overnight. So that is the type of reflexive and reflective methodological structure, methodology that we use, where if you look at like this image, which is in the Syrian refugee camps, you can see that this is something that is, uh, that was created by the, by the, our Syrian refugee artists. They are the ones who painted it with the local youth. And the dream is that they can tell those stories uh, and be able to promote messages within their own communities. Now, if you go to the next image, you can see we have children. This is this is a little boy named Ayub who we worked with, who actually uh, had been tortured by the Assad regime in Syria, and and you know we're dealing. You know, I, I noticed that the name of this section is arts and healing. Um, I think healing is a very nuanced term that has many different meanings across many different environments. I think healing does not just mean one thing. Emotional healing. healing Physical healing, psychological healing, spiritual healing, mental healing, sociological healing. There's so many different types of healing that that need to um, embark. And if we go to the next photo, um, uh, you can see an example is this little boy. That's Ayub over there on the left painting, um, uh, being able to work through his trauma. Yeah. And, and what does that mean? Because what we do is not conventional art therapy. We are not clinicians working with patients, patients in a conventional sense. Rather, we are we are really facilitators of community-based public art education experiences. And what's the difference? I believe that there is inherently a therapeutic value to community-based public arts. Now, that is not conventional therapy, but there are therapeutic values. That little girl, Noor, that you see in that photo, you know, she had just fled one of the worst civil wars in history in Syria. And yet, that may not be the face of what you expect a little girl to look like who's in one of the most barren refugee camps you could imagine. Azraq refugee camp is what it's called. Yet this is the resilience of humanity. This is the healing that can come through the arts. 
And that healing is something that I believe is multifaceted. So if we go to the next photo, when we start to talk about healing, it's just as important that this man, whose name is Muhammad Ibrahim, his healing is just as important as Noor's. Now, Muhammad Ibrahim, um, I, I have a great, really important story that I think everybody should hear about him. I was, I was sitting and I was talking with him and he looks at me. He's one of, he's one of our lead artists, Syrian, from Dara, Syria. He looks me in the face and he says, Max, what is the most difficult question you've ever been asked? And I look at him and I say, I don't know, Muhammad Ibrahim. It's a hard question. I said, what's the hardest question you've ever been asked? And he looks me dead in the face and he says, when my four-year-old son asked me, why are people trying to kill us? Yeah. And, and, he, and he said, he looked at his little son and he said, I don't know why people are trying to kill us, but we don't hate anybody. And he looks at me and he says, I know what it's like to watch my four-year-old son and three-year-old daughter starving and not be able to give them food or water, and being on the brink of death. Yeah. And he looks at me and he says, every day is better than the last. And I look at him and I say, how can you say that, Muhammad Ibrahim? And he looks at me and he says, because we're still alive. And what gives my life meaning, this is what he's saying, is that I can still make art and that nobody can take that away from me. Yeah. And, and Muhammad Ibrahim, I worked with him for the last three years in Azraq refugee camp and he was leading our programs and he, we taught him how to teach others. So we have a training of trainer model where we teach our artists how to work with others in their own communities. Now, unfortunately, um, uh, Muhammad Ibrahim, uh, his second, I believe it's his third cousin, uh, ended up finding out had a connection to uh, Daesh or ISIS, which you may have heard of. So because of that, uh, him and his whole family were put in what's called Camp 5, which is a, a prison inside of the refugee camp. And after we tried to get him out through UNICEF and UNHCR and our partners on the ground, we couldn't get him out. So he actually, about uh, three months ago, just returned to Syria yeah, with his family. So he's in Syria right now. I video called with him three days ago. Um, and he's still he's still alive and he's still doing 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 OK. Um, but the most important thing is now those skills, nobody can take away from him. So he is starting an art illusion program in Dara, in Syria, inside the conflict zone. And we're not right now working with Fin Aid and with UNICEF to try to get funding to him to be able to make that happen. So the idea. No, I need to interrupt your stream because yeah, I, mean, this is, I know the but, timing. I know it's 15 minutes. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to um, go away. We just have a great, like, I want you to keep going, but I'm going to start no, 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 interjecting no, 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 questions, questions Interject from, them, please. from the live stream. And I think it's appropriate here is they're wondering, um, I think it's someone from our, our friends from Queen Elizabeth High School in Calgary who joined online. And um, one of them is wondering, how long do you spend teaching in each community? And then, like, how do you choose these communities? Like, do they approach you? Do you approach them? Like, so how long and how are they chosen? Amazing question. Um, so I will give an answer to each. Let's first start actually with how they're how um, they're chosen. So so um, they're chosen based on partnerships, right? So it's critical to have reliable and stable partners in every one of these environments. We do not go in by ourselves and uh, and and just decide we're going to randomly choose this random community. We usually, it's a long negotiation process that can take months or years. By the way, pause. This is the image I was telling you about, about preventing domestic violence and boys and girls getting along. This is that, that image. And these are, it was actually the mother of that girl who you see who came up and, and asked me about changing the theme. So I think that's important to, to see. So it's about partnerships. So who are you working with? Are we working with UNICEF or the Red Cross or UNHCR, or the European Union or the U.S. State Department or the International Rescue Committee or any of our, our global partnerships? We work with many global partners and they then work with CBOs, community-based organizations. And so, for example, if we work with UNICEF, we are not only working with UNICEF. They might be funded through UNICEF, but the actual program might be a collaboration, let's say, with Mukti, who is a small uh, Bangladeshi local NGO. Um, and so we will work with local non-for-profits in facilitation with global non-for-profits. And our locations are many, time many times determined by those partnerships and where we are able to have, number one, reliable relationships, trustworthy partners, and three, everybody has to know that we're coming and what we're going to be doing before we arrive. Yeah, that's very important. Now, number two, this is in India, uh, working with recycled materials and trash doing a percussion workshop. 
Um, and then number two, the question about how long do we spend in each community? That's a great question. So we remember my role and the role of my partner and, um, and our headquarters team is we do what we call teaching artist education programs. Okay. So what, so I, although I go and I'm leading a workshop like these with the kids, it's all interactive training, interactive education, where we're teaching these local artists. That process can take anywhere between two to six weeks in phases. So, for example, in the Rohingya refugee camps, I have been there five times in the last two and a half years since the major influx at the end of 2017. Um, and actually, it's now only about three years. And, and they have been... Um, uh, and I've been there each time for about two to six weeks, and each time is a different phase of training for our artists. So just because you go and do one big training doesn't mean it's finished. We go, I will do a training, then my partner will come, he will do a training, then I will come back, I will do another training. We will bring in a prof you know another professional artist. Um, if you, there's an artist we work with named Vic Muniz, who's one of our global ambassadors. He, for example, I brought him to the Rohingya refugee camps to be able to help facilitate teaching about photography and narrative building. Um, so the, so, so because of that, the timing ranges, you know, I've spent multiple months in these environments, but, but the goal is not that it's about what we are doing as, as the trainers, but rather what are the capacities and capabilities and skills that the artists are learning and how much time does that take? And the answer is that that's an, an unending process. Professional development can, can continue for very long periods of time. And these are folks, some of which, who may not even have a basic education. Yeah. So some of our artists may not be literate. For example, in the Rohingya context, they were never allowed to make art in Myanmar. They were never allowed to be teachers. They were never allowed to be artists. They were never allowed to even learn literacy-based skills. So we're dealing with folks who many times are at a tabla rasa, right? And that's a Latin term for blank slate. Yeah, this is a good photo of the uh, uh, puppetry performance creature that I work with. Um, and if we're touching on art and healing, the idea of imagination, yeah, the idea that, that we as artists and educators can provide an outlet for those both to have an imagination, but also to realize that, that people and that those of us and who are participants and learners have the right to have a dream. Now, that sounds like a very basic concept for those of you who are on the, the, the call right now. Uh, many times are, I've been told you have the right to have a dream like this. This is a, uh, one of our interactive percussive sculptures um, built uh, in, in the favela Vigigal in, um, in, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Now, what, what does that mean, that concept of, of building a dream? The idea is that for many boys and unfortunately even more girls in the world, they are told that they do not have the right to have a dream, that they will marry at a young age, that they do not have the right to get an education, they do not have the right to, 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 to go to college, for example. And one of our goals is that the arts can be a catalyst to being able to believe that you can have a dream. That, go, that boys and girls equally deserve dreams, that men and women equally deserve dreams, and most importantly, that adults can provide that seed, can plant that seed in children, that they can pursue their own dreams and that they can have those dreams. And we have to prove that this is even possible, right? So if we build a sculpture like this or paint a mural or do a puppetry performance like, like, like this, that little boy you see in the photo right now believes that that's possible believes that doing puppetry performance is possible, building a giant sculpture out of trash is possible. Um, but but um, uh, the, 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 the important piece to this is starting to consider that it's not just about the art making. The art making is a way of being able to get into the into the process of discussing these issues, but it's not just the ends in itself. Um, by the way, if you if you go back, just or you can look at this. This uh, very disparate and desperate looking location is in the Calais refugee camp in France on the border of the UK. Um, now you can go to the next one, and you can see out of this very disparate landscape, these are uh, refugees who mostly come from Sudan, South Sudan, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen. 
Syria, Palestine. And what we did is we did this large series of programs. And it was and and these programs, unbelievably, if you if you keep going, we, we produced about about uh, five or six different pieces. And what ended up happening was, and this was the first time that that is a South Sudanese, that is a Sudanese man and an Afghani man who had never talked. In Sudan, they speak Arabic. They speak what is called Juba Arabic. And in Afghanistan, they speak Pashtun and Urdu. Yeah. Now, these two men had never had a reason to ever meet, to even talk. And yet the arts were able to bring them together through the act of co-creation, like with this man, Rashid. Yeah. We see that these relationships are the most central and important component to the work. Yeah? It's interactional, it's social, it's relational. So in other words, what's important to realize, if you keep going through these, you see these, these what I think are very beautiful images that we created. For example, this was a gorilla uh, that was painted. The idea was about uh, the importance of strength and resilience in such difficult times like the gorilla that many of these individuals um, lived, lived uh, in, their, in their homes. Now look, what, what do you see here? You see total destruction. You see that first mural, that first uh, image, you see it's destroyed, right? I get, after I leave and we did these incredible programs, I get, a, I get a phone call three weeks later from our artists and they burned every single one of our murals. Okay. The French police uh, destroyed the entire camp and burned the entire camp to the ground. Right? So I'm looking at these images of a burning mural. Yeah, and the last one is the one of the gorilla. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, so what was the point of us doing this? Right? Like, what was the purpose of doing this whole thing? You know, it all just got destroyed. And I realized, it wasn't just about the mural. It was about the connections and the relationships that we developed through that process. And I'm still in good contact with Rashid. I'm still in contact with Kenny Bell. And I'm still in contact with the artists that I worked with there. And that is the most important component, is the relationships that it was able to build, even though all the murals got burned. Now, Josephine is joining us from Nigeria. And Great. she's wondering... Um, you know, for some, so that's a wonderful, like that the, the relationships will sustain and, and, and live beyond the projects. But for those, say, perhaps youth who want to continue and who want to participate, how do you sustain the projects in the communities after you leave or after your artists leave? Is there, like, is it the youth themselves are inspired to carry it on? Or? Well, actually, the, the artists never leave. The artists are refugees who live in those communities. Right. So, so we teach. When I say we have 20 Rohingya refugee artists, I literally mean we have 20 artists that are locked in the refugee camp who are painting murals with their own communities every day, right? In, if, if you're joining us from Nigeria, in Uganda, we have our team of the Bidi Bidi Artolution artists who are South Sudanese and Ugandan artists, and they live in the camps, right? And so they are refugees themselves. So all of our programs are training local refugee artists to do this for themselves. Now... I want to answer the second part of that question, which is really important. So the first answer is our artist, like Muhammad Ibrahim, is in Syria. Our artists in, 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 uh, in, in Colombia are on the border of Venezuela. By exa uh, for example, this here, by the way, is a training I did in the Greek refugee camps. And you can see that on the left, that is a big sound instrument, sound instrument, which is greeting everybody. And I'll just take a quick second before I finish answering that question, is that here, this has an amazing story to it, which is uh, we're right on the border of Turkey and, you know, boats were coming up, you know, with people with the blankets and the whole thing. And so and so what happened is uh, everyone's coming up, you know, shivering. Right. And and as they as they come up, what's what's remarkable is that um, one man comes over to me and he sees all these children playing with this with drumsticks and they made up a song and we made up an entire performance. And, and this man comes over to me dripping, wet, freezing. And he grabs me and he kisses me on, on each cheek and, and hugs me, uh, totally soaking, soaking wet. And he drops to his knees and he says, this isn't what I thought a refugee camp would look like. This is what freedom looks like. Yeah. And, and it was a very poignant statement, right? And if we, act, we talk about art and healing. I think the relationship between psychological conceptions of freedom, behavioral ideation of the future, these are intrinsically connected to the health and well-being of communities in crisis. Um, and the second part of your question that we got from Nigeria was about how do we support them? And the answer is funding, right? And that's the unfortunate truth is that we need 
funding. That's how we pay our artists to do these programs, right? Now, now the I wish I could say we just you know we we just started and, and it's just easy. That's unfortunately the hardest part. The hardest part is sustainably funding our teams of artists. Um, unfortunately, making them have a consistent work. Now we do have long term partnerships with institutions like UNICEF, UNHCR, the International Organization of Migration, UNFPA, the Red Cross, Red Crescent, uh, the International Rescue Committee. Um, oh, wait, 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 go back one more time. Sorry. I know, I um, love this story, man. Okay, this yeah, is yeah, such yeah, a yeah, great yeah. story. <laughs> I'll tell the story real quick. Um, yeah. uh, you know, every one of these images could tell a thousand stories, as you could exactly. kind of imagine. But, um, but I'll, I'll just take a couple of little highlights. You know, um, this was in uh, this was in Israel and Palestine, right on the border, actually. And we did a program working with Israeli and Palestinian youth with with Muslim and Jewish kids. And um, and actually, neither of the parents wanted them to join because they thought that they would attack each other. And um, and I had to go house to house uh, explaining. Um, how to be able to, what, what the purpose of the project was and why they needed to let their kids participate. So finally, after days of me convincing and going to the Arabic community and to the Israelis and saying, come on, we can make this happen, they finally let their kids participate. And, and when they start to, 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 to paint, the, 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 this boy and girl is painting next to each other. And, and they were getting along and laughing and painting. And I said, can I take a photo of you? And I took a picture of these, of, of these kids and they're smiling and she puts her arm around this boy, right? And and what was amazing is it's this beautiful moment. Okay? We got told the next day that no person online could ever see this. We were not allowed to share it online because they didn't want anybody to know that their children had interacted with people of the other culture. Yeah. And yet this moment did happen. This this did happen. This was a moment of connection, of healing, such deeply embedded tearing of society we were able to heal in this moment through the process of public art which i think is 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 crucial to being able to look at what's possible now to finish that statement um sorry about, about funding is that we are constantly fundraising we're constantly looking for new ways to fundraise uh this new era that we're in has really been hard for us unfortunately as with most arts and cultural sectors um mm -hmm. they get hit hardest the first uh first you know we want to support our teams of artists year-round fully. And we believe that people should make a living wage by being art educators and art teachers. Um, so the answer is both through through the partnerships, but also through, um, through fundraising. So Andrew has a, a great question from the live stream that ties into to the last photo. But how do you, um, how do you choose who participates from the community? Um, is it just who shows up or are they selected? So we, we consider it to be what we call a self-selecting population usually. So for example, in this, in this, for, in, in this example that you're seeing up ahead, it's not easy to get Israeli and Palestinian youth to work together, right? That's not an easy, um, thing to do. So it's not like we just randomly go and choose people. We have programs that we embed ourselves within. So, for example, working with the Parent Circle Families Forum, that's, that's a program that, that works with people who've been through trauma. Um, we, we, we've done programs uh, previously with the U.S. State Department. We did programs with the U.N. And they had pre-existing what they call encounter programs. And then we would build off of that. Now, we do that across all of our contexts where, for example, if there's a school that we're working with, we make this open to everybody. And then whoever wants to participate comes. Usually, everybody wants to participate, so we then, you know, are able to section it out into um, relevant um, groups, into groups that are able to to to, to make that happen. Uh, the other the other question is is who is who participates from the artists? How do we find and select the artists? Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that is a uh, very difficult process based on the community. We like to have partners that are able to uh, to find them. For us, so UNHCR, uh, you know, United Nations High Commission of Refugees, can you please find refugee artists for us before we arrive? We will do an interview process and then we will select. However, that's unfortunately a very clean and nice, neat example. Usually it doesn't work quite like that. By the way, quick pause on this photo. Um, the, 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 this image is with the Parent Circle Families Forum, working with parents who had had their children killed in the conflict. 
Yeah. So this is not necessarily the face of a woman you would expect who had had her daughter as a child, uh, unfortunately, passed away and was killed in the conflict there. Yeah. Yet these the arts are able to become this source of dialogue, this 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 source of communication um, that is transcendent. Right. And that transcendence, I believe, yeah, you can keep going. Is is what allows for the best to come out. You know, this was this mural uh, was actually started in Palestine, um, in the West Bank, and then by twenty bereaved mothers, and then we brought it to Israel to Tel Aviv, where it was finished by twenty bereaved Israeli parents who had, had their children also killed, and that together they created this piece. And then, and what was amazing is we got a permit a week later to bring uh, those uh, one hundred and fifty Palestinians over from the West Bank into Israel to have a, a dialogue circle. And then we ended up finishing this mural, which then got displayed at the United Nations building right, in New York. So, 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 so the point is, people said this wasn't even possible. People said I was crazy for saying that, 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 that this was something that needed to happen. And yet, this is that, that, that quote, and yet, and yet, in spite of all odds, in spite of all divisions and barriers, we were able to create a piece of art that represented these communities equally. So I think a great question that Andrew asked that tied into to this sort of story is like, how do they select what, um, what the mural will look like? How is the theme chosen and the images and, and the colors? How has all that come together? It's a great question. Um, so we have an entire uh, curriculum. Um, we have a whole methodology that's very in depth of it. It's about 85 pages of a training manual that we distribute to all of our teams. But I will not read you 85 pages. I will condense yeah. it into a short uh, response. So basically, the first step is that they actually see murals and photos. All the, all the murals and photos you're seeing, they see them across every uh, project we do. So they so we bring big photos like this. If I have some, you know, big images, laminated photos of kids from around the world that you can imagine like that. And what we do is we get them to see them so they realize they're not alone, that this is not just about their one project. This is about uh, coming together with, with their fellow learners and artists from around the world through the process of making art. So once they realize that, then we, we have an entire dialogue circle where we are able to get each of these kids uh, to make drawings um, about what are the most important issues in their lives. And we do different music workshops, breathing workshops, meditation workshops to get the children in a folk, in a place to be able to really be, be able to express what's most important to them. Then we are able to take all these images and we put them up on a wall. And then we have a dialogue about how do we take all those different drawings and put them into a single story. And then the artist is up at the front and all of the youth and participants are the ones who are coming up here. If you go to the next image, um, all the youth and participants uh, are, who come with all these much smaller images. So you look at this and this is a woman sheltering herself from the, from the rain or from the challenges and the struggles. Yeah. And so and, and, and the colors are discussed. The composition is discussed the way that we're going to make it. And that artist is up at the front drawing it a very rough sketch. And then throughout the process, then the youth and the participants transfer that idea onto the canvas itself or into the wall. Right. Then they they do all of the details. They do all of the filling in. And then the artists then are helping to make the whole composition come together. So if we go to the next image. I think you'll see an entire, right. So you can see all these different areas that one different kid, for example, this is working in the Yad Biyad school, another Israeli-Palestinian project, working with kids who, where a third of the school had been tried to be burnt down by extremists who didn't believe that Jews and Arabs should be learning together, right? And so they, they their response was, we're going to paint a mural and we're going to make it birds coming out of this person's head. The idea that, 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 that dreams can become reality, right? And if you go to the next image, uh, you can see this idea was that they come into this person's head. And if you see down at the bottom, it's all these people playing music, celebrating that there is a new hope, right? Every one of those, one kid came up with the idea of the birds. A different kid came up with the idea of the celebration through the music. A different kid came up with the idea of the umbrella with the person protecting themselves from the storm. And go to the next image, if you could. Um, 
great. And so this is the final image, right? And so you can see that image of people coming from that very challenging past with the cooler tones, somebody, somebody whose entire face and head is shattering like glass, changing our perceptions of the past, looking towards the current now of the person looking up ahead, to the left, the person looking towards the future, and it, it's read from right to left like Arabic and Hebrew. And then you see that it ends with the birds coming out and going into the hopeful hopeful future. So that's a good example to answer that question, which is, it is what we call an interactive storytelling methodology, right? So the stories come from the artists and the kids themselves. That's amazing. Now, um, we have a question from Sasha, who lives in the Yukon, um, and she's wondering if you've done any projects with First Nations communities or Indigenous communities, and or, or have you thought of, you know, like expanding beyond refugees or is that really sort of um your not your niche but like where you're most comfortable but wh what other communities can you or do you work in it's a great question so the funniest part well, maybe not funny but the interesting part is i started doing work with indigenous communities um i didn't start working in refugee camps mm. um so i did a lot of programs with the maori communities in new zealand um i worked there for six months um doing mural programs throughout the country i worked with aboriginal communities in the central desert of australia in uh in alice springs We've done extensive programs with Latin American uh, indigenous communities in Costa Rica, uh, the border of Nicaragua. We've done work with, with the Guayami, the Bri Bri, the Cadacar, and the Malacu. Uh, we worked extensively with indigenous communities in Mexico, working with the Huichole communities uh, near Zacatecas, um, as well as working with First Nation Native community in Canada, in, uh, in uh, Vancouver. Um, I did work for a long time working with people in a rehabilitation uh, center, um, and and specifically uh, focused on First Nation Native folks who have who are who are battling with addiction. Um, so we did a lot. So there's huge application um, to Indigenous communities. We still do programs with Indigenous communities a lot, largely focusing in Colombia um, with the Indigenous communities who are now mixing with the Venezuelan refugees, who are both marginalized communities in Colombia, um, in Santa Marta, Cali, and um, on the North Pacific coast. Um, so, so, uh, and, and, and so just going back for a second to the photos, this is in Osrock refugee camp, as you've probably been seeing. It's a very bleak landscape. It's a very difficult place. And yet, um, you can see, you know, the color that comes, right? And, and to ask that question, I think there's, there's, there's trauma in most communities in the world. No matter if it's in the developing or the developed world context, the global north, global south, the indigenous or um, those who are who have come, or as they say in New Zealand, the Modi or the Pakiha, um, is is that is that the arts are something that can deal with intergenerational trauma. It can deal with intercultural trauma. It can deal with 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 levels and dynamics of micro traumas and macro traumas that many times nothing else can 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 actually work with. And I say that because it's really hard to talk about domestic violence. Like, it's really hard to talk about gender-based violence. This is hard stuff to talk about. And you can't just go into a room and say, okay, we're going to fix all these problems. It's, it's not something that works that way. It's something that you have to change behavioral tendencies. You have to shift the way that people believe of themselves and what's possible to do with trash. If we, if, if we look at the, one of the greatest traumas in the world right now, it's the environment. Right. And and if we look at what we've done to our planet, it's 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 devastating. So doing a program like this is taking two abandoned cars in Za'atari refugee camp. And we were able to get these kids to come and, and transform them. If you go to the next image um, into um, into uh, sculptures. Right now. Now, this is both about actually that program, but it's also about having the Syrian refugee youth and teachers realize that this is even possible, right? Many folks never even realize that that sense of possibility is an integral part to the creative process, right? Understanding what's possible. So if you go to the next image, right, um, which I hope you'll get, well, you see, you know, the kids are painting all these images and we use synesthetic design. So what that means is synesthesia is the idea that the senses overlap. So it's the idea that if I bang like this, and then I, I bang on this or this, that every one of those different sounds has a different color associated with the different sounds. So we ask the kids to explore their senses by painting the different objects according 
to the different sounds. So you see, you, you see this here. Now, these are our artists also exploring their sense of play uh, within the, 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 the Syrian context. And if you go to the next image, um, I think there's one more after that. Am I right? Yes, there it is. Okay, that was the image I wanted to show you. So look at it. So now we have these two goofy, crazy looking creatures of these abandoned cars that were just stranded out in the desert. And now we see that they can become these welcoming, innovative, you know, ways of being able to see the world and what trash can do. And it's all about recycling. It's all about sustainability. It's all about the environment, right? So being able to teach through possibility and being able to understand that possibility to accomplish maybe what was thought of as impossible is not impossible. And it provides a role model that both teachers who we, who we train and who live in these communities, as well as the youth themselves, can actually have mentorship based around this idea of expanding possibilities. So that our artists are able to work with teenagers who can then work with children. And these layered senses of, of, um, of, of, of learning is something that we think is really important. Now, I've, I've just sort of stopped the sharing, I think. Oop. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, cause I'd love for these last, we only have four more minutes. It's been amazing. I know it's gone so fast and um, I'd love for you to be able to speak not through your images, but, but to the youth now, because I think oftentimes in schools we're taught to care about an issue and then the next week to move on to a new issue. And it's not that we, we were told to stop caring about it, but there's just not enough time to really to, to go into it deeper. And I think it's kind of dangerous for, for students to get used to the idea of caring passion about something and then flipping to something new, like as though we're changing channels on TV show. And so for the Center for Global Education, we're always emphasizing action. Like, how do you complete that circle? So how do you take what you've learned and care about and deeply want and are, are feeling moved about it and move it into an action or an advocacy or an awareness? And so, and, and this came through one of the questions off of our uh, live stream as well as what can youth do? How can they help you? How can they get involved? Or what can they do in their own communities that sort of takes this to the next? You know, it doesn't leave it behind, but actually completes this circle. I think that's a phenomenal question. Um, and I ask myself that question every day. And that question never exactly gets fully answered, but every day it grows and evolves. Um, here would be my answer. Everything builds upon itself, right? I believe that it's like building a sandcastle, right? It's like building something where whether it be refugee issues indigenous issues gender-based violence queer issues issues about um uh, equity in the learning space you know the, the the key is that they all build upon each other right it's not like they're separate they're all intrinsically connected we live in a world of interconnection and ecosystem and ecosystems that learn from each other i think the biggest thing that i hope whoever is listening uh, on this on this live stream is is that the action that needs to be taken, I'm going to lay out three different ways of taking action. Okay? The first way of taking action is, is, is that you don't just have to choose one issue and forget everything else. But it's not bad to choose an issue and go really deep into that and let every other issue inform that. So I chose a really specific lens of community-based public art education. That's my lens. But inside that one lens, that peephole, if you can imagine, right, is the whole world right? Is the whole world. And I say that because the world all plays a role inside of our work. All of those issues that you were talking about all play a role, number one. So it's all connected. So I think it's understanding that connectivity and being able to, to if there's one thing I can say, just choose something and go with it. You can always change. You can always morph. morph you can always evolve, but you got to choose something. And you know, when I, I did a bicycle trip from San Francisco to Rhode Island, from California to New York, and I bicycled uh, coast to coast, and I met a guy, and he said something to me. And he worked in Kosovo with the UN during, during the Balkan War, and he said, live to ride, ride to live, when falling, die. And it's that idea that, when, that making that plunge is the most important thing, yeah, number one. Wow. Number two, now is a time for action. Yeah, now is a crucial time for action. And I think if you can't leave your homes, like most of us in North America here and the world, um, is, that, is that there's so much that we can do in the era of technology. Doing a, a small you know, Facebook fundraiser for Art Illusion or for a cause that you care about 
Yeah. That's for, I, I'm on the receiving end of this stuff. And I will tell you, it makes a huge difference. Like, a, like for our artists, uh, you know, you know, if you did a fundraiser and raised a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, right. Or $5, it, it, it makes a world of a difference to our artists who are living on $3 a day. Yeah. I mean, I mean, so, so I, I'm going to be totally transparent money from places like Canada, America, Europe, that the, the value of a dollar is very different. And I, and, and I think finding ways of, of, of garnering support is more important now than ever, especially for the arts and education. Yeah. And, 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 and I, and, and the last thing I'll say is that Right now, uh, all, we, we actually, uh, all of our artists in the Rohingya camps, for example, are, are in their homes. They can't be leaving because of social isolation or because of social distancing. So we're getting them to actually make images about public health and solidarity with, with the world on paper and canvas in their homes alone with their families. Okay? And then they're sharing it with the world, right? And the idea is that, you, that, that we can adapt to whatever the situation is. Arts can adapt. And this is my third final point, which is awareness. Yeah. Share the awareness about about our work, about the work of organizations that you care about and get people to care. I think the biggest fear in the world is apathy, is the, is the idea that 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 one refugee kid, you know, in in, in that are coming from Myanmar and Bangladesh or in Syria, that 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 they're different than you, but they're not. Yeah, we we are all connected. Whether you're in the Yukon and you're for, and from a First Nation Native community, or whether you know you're coming from Nigeria, from an Igbo or a Yoruba community, that that we are all connected. And the awareness and that interconnection, I think, is more important now than ever um, because of the divides that we're seeing across the world. So making awareness of the issues you care about, trying to raise you know funding if you can for issues you care about, and and maybe most importantly, taking action on a defined definitive role and if anything set goals for yourself you know by the end of next week i want to have wrote written email to an organization i care about right or whatever it is set a goal stick to your goals make yourself have deadlines yeah and and probably the biggest thing that i can say if, if i can is that no matter what happens in your life no matter the trials tribulations journeys and adventures that you take to live a life that is embedded with with making the world a better place, with repairing the world, with creating more meaning within the world, it, there's nothing more fulfilling. And it gives you a reason to wake up every morning. Well, Max, those are inspiring words to end our session today on. I want to thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank UNESCO for helping us provide this uh, a great session today. And to all of the, the students that joined us on live stream, that joined us live today on the, on the event, um, please follow uh, Artolution on Instagram. And I'm sure that if you have extra questions for Max, I've sent him DMs on Instagram before. They're very responsive. And so please follow, support. Um, if you'd like to come to more events, we're hosting them. You, know, you can check out our Facebook book page, Center for Global Education. We have more events about one a week coming up over this course of the school closure. Um, thank you and, uh, to all of our, our participants. And Max, it's been amazing having you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Have a wonderful day, a wonderful morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining from. <laughs>